I think that doesn't know. <laughs> Go? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Tajik, uh, and I'm a bad programmer. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here in Riga on this, in this support group for bad programmers. So hopefully I can share my experiences and get some validation or some pat on the back and maybe even some help. Uh, but I've come here not just to blame myself. I want to blame my tools, right? And I know what you're thinking. I know how that sounds, right? The poor workman blames his tools. That's the old saying. And there is always truth to old sayings. Uh, but there is another one I like that I think is related. And that's the fact that when you're holding a hammer, everything starts looking like a nail. Right? And uh, the reason for that is because tools are opinionated. They are not just generic. They usually suggest some way of doing things, either by design or not. Right? They make something easy and something hard. And one of the ways we could see something as a good tool or a bad tool is whether it's kind of pushing you into doing the right thing rather than the wrong thing. Right? So if a tool is making the right thing easy, then it's arguably better than the one that's doing the opposite. Right? But not all tools are like this. Uh, and if we're talking about specifically uh, an object-oriented language or a library or a framework or however you want to call it, uh, I, we could say that it's a good tool or a good language or a good library if it kind of influences your design in a good way, if it suggests the right way of doing things, of doing good object-oriented design rather than the bad one, right? Discouraging the anti-patterns, not making it easy to do things badly and wrongly, right? So what is good object-oriented programming. Now, that's a controversial topic. Everybody sees it a little bit differently. But there are some things that are pretty much universally true that I will be basing this on. So object orientation in general is about putting data and operations of that data together as one single entity, rather than treating those as two completely different things, like we sort of traditionally used to. Uh, and th two big benefits from that is that, first of all, it becomes a lot easier to just use the data directly. We don't need to know all that goes on under the hood. We don't need to know all the edge cases or the complexities of it. We are given a hopefully simple enough interface that does the right thing and that prevents us from hurting ourselves too much. Right? As long as the abstraction is good, uh, this kind of works out. Right? It makes it e easier to write good code to use somebody else's code to our advantage. The other part, on the other hand, is it's easier to write the thing that we can then extend further. So as long as we hide the irrelevant details or complicated details inside the objects and we don't expose them accidentally or not to the outside, uh, it's easier for us later to modify what those operations actually do under the hood, change the internal structure, change the underlying implementation without breaking everybody else's code. Right? So for example, uh, a hash in Perl. Right? When you're using a Perl hash, you don't need to know that there is hashing involved, that there is buckets, that there is collisions, and whatever goes on in there. You just use it. Right? There is simple operations assigned to a key, retrieve value from a key, and so on. Uh, and similarly, because the underlying implementation is actually mostly hidden, uh, if tomorrow protocol developers decided to swap it over and use like a binary tree instead, most of the code would still work exactly the same because we don't interact with the hash algorithms the data directly. We just use the predefined operations. Right? And that's one of the good parts about object-oriented programming. Uh, and it, it works well if we keep those two things mostly separate when they don't influence one another, where our API, our public interface, is not defined by the underlying implementation and vice versa. Right? And if we start to break that separation, it doesn't stop working. Right? It doesn't completely break. Uh, it's just not as good as it could have been. Right? So it's not like our code is suddenly broken because we messed those two things up. We still get some of the niceties. We still have you know, the arrow syntax, and we don't have to pass the self around. But the actual benefits of this whole object-oriented design theory, they kind of disappear. Right? We're missing out on the actually good parts. Uh, and if we look at, the, uh, for example, the Perl documentation, it actually points that out. It says in Perl 002 that it's best to consider the internal data open, that it's not something that we're supposed to be paying that much attention to from the outside perspective, right? That it's just something in there, and we're supposed to just look at the operations that are provided to us, right? At the public interface, so to say. Uh, and if we look at the syntax for that in traditional Perl 5, uh, it matches that idea pretty well, right? So we defined our uh, objects, our classes, as packages, uh, they have subroutines inside, uh, and those subroutines are the methods of the objects that will be created. They are the 
publicly exposed operations, and the internal data internal state is all internal, right? It's probably in there somewhere, it's probably used, but it's not something that the objects advertise very much, right? They are mostly just there because they need to be there, you know, like a plot in a porno. So, uh, what thing that we can improve it here? This is pretty good. Uh, this is very flexible, and that's why we were able to build so much stuff on top of that and build all those wonderful tools, like Moon, for example. Uh, so what can really improve? Why did we actually start working towards something different than this? Well, one thing that we could improve here uh, is make the data structure that's kept inside somewhat specified. Because yes, it's supposed to be internal, it's supposed to be hidden, but it becomes much easier to work on the object itself, on its implementation, when we have some specification to fall back on, that we know what's supposed to be inside, what expectations do we have on it, what constraints do we put, to kind of look that over is, is, is very useful and very good. Uh, another kind of classic problem of OOP is dependency injection. So when we have our objects, they are usually not independent. Uh, they need some other objects to work on or work with. And there is always a dilemma of should we create those ourselves as our own dependencies or should we take them from the outside? Uh, typically, or sometimes we want to do a little bit of both. So maybe allow injecting them from the outside, but also have some same defaults uh, so that's something that we could sort of use our OO system or library to help managing that. Uh, and one thing that we could also improve, which is not really related to OO, and it's more related to Perl itself, is that we could improve on the way we pass arguments to functions. Because that's, well, Perl does have subroutines signatures now, as Sawyer told us. Uh, they are there, but they're not all that great. And in, in object-oriented programming, we want to have a specific, clear, description of what our object expects, what kind of data is supposed to go in, what do the methods actually want, uh, how do we create the damn thing, and so on. So uh, having a very good, very versatile scheme of describing what we actually expect to come from the outside more than Perl does by default uh, would also be kind of a nice thing, right? And we could potentially put that in, in an OWL library. Uh, so fortunately, there is a thing that does this, and it's called Moose, right? It's this wonderful uh, tool that provides all of these three things, right? We have a description of the internal state, the data structures, the constraints on those. We have a mechanism for DI. We have much improved uh, specification of what incoming data is supposed to come, at least for the new method, right? We can say that this is supposed to be provided in this and this and this and this and in that form. And unfortunately, in my opinion, uh, it has the same solution to all of these three things. So. Uh, there is just one keyword that does it all, and I don't really think that it's something that should be treated as, as a single solution to all of these problems, because yes, that is very perilish. We have one thing that does everything depending on how you use it. But I think that here in, in the object-oriented world, it's especially important to separate those things, to separate the implementation, the underlying thing, from the interface, the public thing. And if we're using the same tool to describe both, I think it kind of falls apart, and we sort of start blurring all this difference and it doesn't work out that well in practice. So I don't really have a problem with Moose as a whole. I have a problem with the syntax, right? I don't mind all the nice stuff going under the hood, the roles and mostly the roles uh, for myself personally, but I, I, I assume that there is a lot of stuff that other people like or am I, I using and I don't know about it, but I don't really like the syntax. Uh, so uh, here is an example of something that I think could have been much improved on. So if you've Consider a web app, right? This one will be using Moo and not Moose. So whenever I'm talking about Moose in this talk, I mean Moo, Moose, Moops, or Perl 6 for that matter, because it basically shares the same traits that are pissing me off. Uh, so in this case, it's going to be Moo, because why not? Uh, so in a web application like this, we will have some sort of roots registry, which will be a mapping between URL patterns, uh, in this case, grouped by method, for example. Uh, and the code that's supposed to handle that, right? So we have a declaration like that in, in Moo, uh, which says that it roots is read-write, it's a hash ref, it has some default value. So what, uh, you know, outside of the context and documentation and stuff like that, just looking at the code itself, what do we know about these roots? So first, is it a part of a public interface or is it part of the internal state? Right? Uh, we could... Yeah, we could, we could say, like, start with an underscore or something oh, as a convention, yeah, yes. <laughs> kind of, yeah. It's, I, I would say more, it's more of a workaround. But yeah. it, it declares accessors, that there is a read and write accessor. So at least we know that this is something that's supposed to be changed 
right? But is it really? Are you supposed to be changing those? Is a web application something that needs the roots to be created? Or do you create it first and then fill it with values? Right? We see that this one has a default value, so presumably you create it first and then you add stuff to it, right? Uh, but should you be creating this with the roots already or adding them later, right? Because it has a default value, but does that mean that there should be, there could be possibly a different value than the default one? I don't think it's very obvious from this. Uh, and if we look at like the broader context, it doesn't become that much better because this is a part of a real code. This is Dancer 2, and that's where it's from. And if we now look at the documentation and the other places in the code and how the code is used, the question becomes somewhat answered. So is root part of the public interface? Well, it's not documented, so we can kind of assume that it isn't. Right? And again, we, in Dancer, we don't use this object directly, usually. But if I were to subclass this and write my own thing, I would very much like to know, is that something that I can rely on? Will that be there in the future? Or am I just messing with internals that I'm not supposed to? Right? Uh, are we supposed to be changing this while the, the object exists, while it's running? Uh, yes, but not through the right accessor. Right? There is a method called addRoot, which doesn't actually use the right accessor. It just kind of messes up with it in a different way. Uh, so it's described here as a read-write, but we're not supposed to be using the accessor that's generated. And in fact, it's not used in the code at all, as far as I can see. Uh, should we be passing roots to new where we create this? Uh, maybe. I didn't find anything that said don't do this, but if it's not part of the public interface, then probably not. But uh, we have this fairly descriptive syntax that really doesn't answer any of these questions. Right? We need to kind of reach for more information look out to the docs, to examples of use, and so on, to determine what this actually is, right? Is it the specification of how the object works, or is it the internals that are there to be internal and not supposed to be accessed directly? Uh, so if this moves syntax and this mechanics, well, you know, it's not just the syntax. There's also a thing happening under the hood, right? But it's not giving us these pieces of information. So what is it really good for? What is it actually doing in that piece of code? And I think the, uh, the most visible thing that it's doing, it's, it gives us an accessor, which is of course a good thing, so we can actually use the damn thing, and it helps the, handles the life cycle of it. So it creates this attribute so that we know that it's there, it's in the right format, it kind of keeps track of whether that format is preserved or not, as long as we use the accessors. Uh, so it basically just handles its lifetime, the life cycle management and accessing of it, right? Uh, so is this really the syntax that we want to use to say, I want this thing to be there and I want to access it internally? Right? Because this tells a lot of other things that are basically unrelated to this. Right? So I don't think it's a very good description, at least from that, from that angle. Uh, and my theory, and I see this pattern, it's not an isolated example. It's an isolated example here. But I see this a lot in Moose code, both in my own and in other people's code, that it seems to be used not as much for declaring attributes and handling those attributes, but it's basically a patch uh, to fix Perl's lackluster argument passing. And something that keeps us away from using bless, which is weird, and some people don't understand it. Uh, it seems to be like the selling point, and it seems to be how people use it. Uh, a lot of the attributes you typically see declared in classes are not actual object attributes, but are just the description of what new is supposed to accept. If you think about what is required used for in Moose, or is required in Perl 6, does it mean that the attribute is required? Of course it is, you know, it's part of the object. So what does the required mean? It means that it's a required argument when you create the object, right? It doesn't describe the attribute. It's what, sorry? This is documented. Yes, it is. It is. I, I, don't, I just don't think this is the best word for it. A required attribute. Can you have a non-required attribute? <laughs> so, th that, th well, that's my problem with it, right? That it's, Moose is all about attributes, and all, it, it is do all documented in a document that says, this is how you create attributes, but not all of those are attributes, right? Sometimes it's just an interface specification. It describes an attribute. Yes, but well, under the hood, it is an attribute. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but it, the thing that you should know, you, sh you shouldn't always know that it's an attribute. Uh, uh, okay, I, I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, so this is how it seems, and that's my theory. And I started digging around, and the more I started digging around in the documentation, the more it kind of reinforced that theory. So if you look at the Perl O tutorial, we talks about Moose. It says that Moose takes care of creating new for you, and it knows about the attributes you declared, so you can set them, right? So between the lines, it reads to me a bit like new is an annoyance that you shouldn't be doing, and attributes are just settings in objects. So they are no longer internal things that we're not supposed to touch. 
they are the things that we're supposed to set. Right? This is the message that this piece of documentation sends. That's how I read it. Uh, if you look at Moose manual again, it's literally somewhat similar. It says, with Moose you concentrate on the structure of your classes and you focus on what rather than how. Right? And how it reads to me is objects are rather than do. So it's, it's all about the structure and to hell with operations. They will generate themselves. It's simple enough. Who cares? Right? Uh, it's a little bit like if you treat everything as a glorified struct, then it all works perfectly fine. You don't have to write new. Why wouldn't you want to? It's one of the most important operations, arguably, in, in the object that you create, the actual initialization. The fact that the initial state is correct. If they are supposed to be immutable, then this is going to be a final state. So you're kind of missing out on that part. And, but not completely, because of course you get hacks that allow you to kind of fix that problem. So, but I think that uh, an issue with this is that it mostly, ex I don't know if it was designed for this, I suppose not, but it seems to be advertised in such a way and used in such a way that it's mostly just fixing Perl's argument handling because it wasn't good enough. And while doing that, it kind of shoves away the idea of separation of concerns in object-oriented programming. So uh, this is uh, another example, uh, a piece of code that I wrote, uh, which I'm not very proud of, but it demonstrates the issue quite well. Uh, so this is a piece of an object that was basically an adapter for this module, right? So it uses this to like create DNS records, delete them later, and so on, and it requires some credentials to be able to use it, right? And it has three attributes. So two of them are required, and one of them is the thing that I create later, right? So again, this require, it doesn't say what attribute is actually required for the object. It just says what it's required to create an object, which, you know, it's kind of confusing in my opinion, but it's just a matter of opinion, right? And basically, the entire dance here is creating three attributes instead of one, because I want to convert incoming attributes to the ones that I actually want, right? Uh, and if you work with Moose for a while, it may seem like it's not the right way to do it, because there are other mechanisms that do exactly that in a proper way, right? I wrote this way, it, it, I wrote it this way initially, and it passed code reviews, and I thought it was fine, uh, because I forgot that build arcs exists. Right? And build arcs is arguably, uh, or build in Perl 6, is what fits exactly this use case. It wants to convert the data that you get when creating an object into the data that the object actually needs. So converts the arguments into attributes. That's exactly what I want, right? So why don't I use it instead? Well, let's try to rewrite this thing so that it uses build arcs, all right? So how many of you know Moose, all right? Okay, of those people, or others, who remembers how do you write build arcs? Four, five? I do, I'm not sure I remember, and I wrote these slides today. Well, no, I read them today. Of course I didn't write them today. Oh, that would be silly. Uh, uh, so yeah, who remembers the syntax for it? Uh, well, no problem, you can look it up. It's in the docs. Maybe it's not the easiest thing to write, but it's not that hard either. You don't write your own build arcs, you kind of overload the existing one, uh, and you take an additional argument, the first one, which is the original build arcs, so that you later call it on the class that you're in, and there you actually initialize the attributes. And meanwhile, you can check for all the constraints that you have on the incoming data, right? So one thing that we wanted to do so far, we wanted those attributes to be required, right? So we no longer have an easy way to say required attributes, but it's not that big of a problem. We can say, oh, unless this argument contains one of these things, uh, I want to die with some error message, right? So I can write this pretty easily, right? I don't think it was easier to write or cleaner than build, but it's more explicit. It tells the better story than, than the previous code. So that's nice. Uh, but there is another problem. If I want to add a type constraint now, how do I do that? There is a string type in Moose. I know how to use it with an ESA, and it's very well documented. Put it as an ESA, and there will be a type constraint, and it will be automatically checked. But if I'm not using has, how do I use it here? Do you know? I don't. I haven't looked it up, to be honest. But I don't know how to use it. I assume there is a way. Maybe there is an ESA on a string, and it's that simple. Uh, but it's much more cleaner, it's much more e easy to write when it's done in the old way, right? So maybe this isn't the bad code after all, the old one, right? Is it really easier with build arcs than it was before? Is it more easy to extend with build arcs than it was before? I'm not convinced. I don't think this is the syntax that somebody kind of standing in this in the same position will choose over the other, right? 
if you don't take into account that, oh yes, this is, those are totally two separate things, you know, the interface and the underlying data, I should be paying attention to this. If you're not paying attention to this explicitly, you will choose the thing that's easier to write and easier to build on, which in my opinion is this. And in my experience, it's this. I see much more build being used like this to kind of a fix up of what the object got than build arcs, which is supposedly the right solution. Uh, so that's, that's my problem with this. Uh, that's, it's making the arguably wrong thing or worse thing, yeah? It could, but it, then, it's, then it really needs to be done with the build instead of the build arcs, I right? Think I think, no? Yeah, it's just, it just has a builder. Yes. So wh where do you get the input data then? The object. The object. Right, so you need to store it at attributes, right? Yes. Exactly, okay, so that's my problem, right? Because now we're, we're treating both those things as kind of the attributes of an object, even though the object doesn't need those as attributes. Yeah. They are just incoming yes, data. That's true. Because yeah. or the actual attributes, or the object dependent. That's my problem with it, right? <laughs> that I, I know that it's very nice to have that one keyword that does it all, and it's a very peril thing to do. And if you know what you're doing, it's a very powerful tool. But I don't think that it's a very good tool if you want to guide someone into yes. doing the right thing. And that includes both new coming programmers who don't maybe exactly know what they're doing, and they're just doing whatever is easier, because they assume that that's the correct thing. But it affects experienced programmers as well, who just are focused on a different thing and are just picking the easier thing to write and the easier thing to maintain. So that's my problem with it. And uh, I think we can do a little bit better, so we can have all of those niceties without breaking that separation. But uh, my idea for this involves just breaking has into smaller pieces. So I would maybe go for something that uh, treats, uh, has a completely different syntax for incoming attributes, so the arguments to new, uh, and then the actual attributes, right? And maybe even a separate syntax for the dependency injection uh, related stuff because it is kind of mixing both two concepts and I think it will be a lot cleaner to kind of deduce things from reading the code and knowing what is what if those things actually had different names instead of <coughs> some different attributes or being documented differently or being uh, written differently in a Hungarian notation or whatever. Uh, I think those are the kind of things that deserve to be treated separately and I would much prefer to see them that way. Right, to have those arguments that we now know are exactly new arguments and nothing else. We now know that they are explicitly immutable. Uh, we, we're not supposed to be changing them later, which is something that Moose always wanted to go for, immutability. It's, it says that in the documentation, but if you look at live code, most, most of the immutability is at the, at, the begin, uh, at the end of the file when it says package meta make immutable and not much where, not elsewhere. Uh, so I, I, I think I would prefer to have those things split, to kind of have this, explicit distinction between what's coming in, what's actually internal and you're not supposed to be touching, and what's the kind of thing that you can swap out and replace, right? And then we can keep most of the same stuff. We can keep the build as something that takes the incoming attributes or the object arguments, we could call them the needs, and turns them into the hashes. So doing basically the job, job of the build arcs, but keeping the benefits of the declarative syntax, right? That would be nice because we wanted this declarative syntax. That's what we're flocking towards. That's what I, I'm pretty sure that most of the people who use Moose, and that's my experience with Moose or Moo, don't care about the meta model, about the roles, about the mixins, about anything below this. They want the nice syntax because nobody wants to write bless, nobody remembers the order of arguments for bless, nobody wants to handle function arguments manually, doing type checks manually. Why would you do it if you have a nice syntax on top of it? That's, I think, what most of us actually need out of this. So I would like to put that uh, at the forefront. So I'm not sure if this is the right solution to this or is it even needed to fix Moose. I think there is a problem in this because when I brought up this talk and the topic of this talk to people and I said, I have a problem with Moose, I think the API is weird. They always said, oh, you mean this or this or this or this. And I said, no, I, I mean this completely different thing. I said, oh yeah, that's true. So <laughs> I think there is more than one problem here and this is maybe not the perfect solution or, and definitely not a solution to all of them. But I think some, uh, some discussion maybe or some debate uh, would be beneficial. Uh, I didn't come to here for validation completely, no? uh, but also to have my views questioned and the ideas criticized. So uh, I don't think we have time for questions, to put it mildly, because there's minus five minutes in the talk. Uh, but uh, if you want to talk about this further, I look like this. Meet me in the hallway track and thank you all for coming. Uh, have a wonderful conference. Yeah. <laughs>
it's not there yet. But <laughs> I'm escaping. 